there are plenty of cases out there that are considered open and shut. We know pretty quickly who committed the crime and it's just a matter of convicting them. Today's case is one of those, but it has plenty of twists and turns that caused an over a two decade delay before the perpetrator was finally brought to justice. Let's talk about Holly Maddox. Helen Maddox, or Holly, was born on May 26, 1947 in Tyler, Texas, the first child of Mother Elizabeth, a homemaker, and Father Fred, an engineer and World War II veteran. Holly would later be joined by sisters Mary, Meg, and Elizabeth, or Buffy, and brother John. Growing up, Holly was described as a beautiful blonde with an almost ethereal beauty and a mesmerizing elegance, but also not vain or egotistical. One of Holly's sisters described her as giving and loving. As a teenager, Holly did well in school, enjoyed art and dance, and was a cheerleader. She was voted most likely to succeed in high school, though I'm not sure which year. She was also salutatorian of her graduating class in 1965. Both Holly's family and the town of Tyler have been described as conservative by various sources. I assume they mean in the cultural and traditional sense, though they could have been politically conservative as well. But Holly rebelled against this and, from what I could tell, seemed stifled by small-town life. After high school graduation, she left Texas to attend Bryn Mawr College in Bryn Mawr, Pennsylvania, about 14 miles west of Philadelphia. She graduated in 1971 with a degree in English. After college, Holly floated from job to job for a while, seemingly not sure of what she wanted to do. Then in 1972, at the age of 25, she was sitting in a restaurant when she was approached by a man named Ira Einhorn. Ira Samuel Einhorn was born on May 15, 1940 in Philadelphia, the oldest of two sons to a car salesman and homemaker. Ira's family appeared close and seemed to love each other just as any normal family would. His mother would later describe their family as a typical Jewish family. Ira graduated from high school in 1957. He went on to attend the University of Pennsylvania, where he graduated with a degree in English in 1961. After graduation, he went on to teach at his alma mater and later on at Harvard. Two words that kept coming up when people described Ira were charming and intelligent. One thing I found interesting was that he never had a lot of money, but somehow always convinced people to pick up expensive tabs for him. He had a lot of famous and influential friends, including Jerry Garcia of The Grateful Dead. As the Washington Post once put it, he had a gift for talking businessmen out of their money and attractive women out of their bell bottoms. On the subject of women, Ira claimed to have thousands of lovers. As an acquaintance of his, Harry J. Katz would later put it, Guys never asked girls what they thought about politics or poetry. Ira did. He feigned that he cared. Much like Holly Maddox, Ira Einhorn was no fan of 1960s conservatism. He protested against the Vietnam War and even ran for mayor at one point. He was also heavily involved in environmentalism, with a 1978 write-up in the Harvard Crimson calling him an early activist in the solar energy and ecology movements. A lot of Ira's behavior could also be described as that of a stereotypical hippie. He did a lot of drugs, namely acid and LSD. One report said that while teaching at the University of Pennsylvania, he stripped naked and brought out joints in class. He also had a reputation for smelling bad. He spent a lot of time in the bathtub, so it wasn't for lack of regular cleaning, but he also refused to wash his clothes. Apparently, the smell was part of his persona, and he thought he was too mystic to regularly bathe, whatever that means. Despite his reputation for not smelling good, Ira was well known and liked in the intellectual circles of Philadelphia in the 1960s and 70s. And one day in 1972, he saw a beautiful blonde at a restaurant he frequented and just had to approach her. 
Holly and Ira's relationship moved quickly. Just two weeks after they started dating, Holly moved in with Ira, but their relationship was as tumultuous as it was speedy. They frequently broke up and got back together. Ira insisted on an open relationship and Holly told one of her friends that Ira would force her to have sex with other people while he watched. Ira would frequently go to parties with Holly, but leave with someone else. There was also physical abuse involved. At some point in their relationship, Holly brought Ira back home to Texas to meet her family, but she knew that they wouldn't like him even before the trip and told her dad as much. Sure enough, Ira didn't exactly make the best impression on the Maddoxes. During the prayer before a family meal, Ira picked at sores on his body. He ate ravenously during the meal and, after it was done, put his feet on the table. Holly's brother John said Ira was too dominating over Holly. Her sister Buffy said he was a slob and obnoxious. She also claimed he made romantic gestures at her. Despite all this, Holly and Ira kept up their on-again, off-again relationship for five years. In the late summer or early fall of 1977, they went on vacation together in London, using money that Holly had saved up. They were later joined there by Buffy, and Holly told her sister that she planned on leaving Ira once they returned to the U.S. Buffy would be the last family member to see Holly. Holly ended up leaving Ira alone during their trip and returned to the U.S. She rented an apartment in New York and even cut her hair, something a lot of women do after breakups, though they weren't technically broken up yet. Over Labor Day weekend, she started seeing a new man named Saul Lapidus. She soon broke things off with Ira for good, and he wasn't happy about it. On September 9th, 1977, Holly was on Saul's boat when she got a phone call from Ira. He had gathered up her things that were still left at his apartment and threatened to throw them in the street if she didn't come get them. Holly called a few people to see if they could pick up her things for her, but nobody could. Saul didn't want her to go back to Ira's apartment, and Holly didn't want to go back either, but she said she would get her things and come right back. Once she arrived at Ira's apartment, they went to a movie with another couple. After that, she wasn't seen again. Most people in Ira's social circle weren't too concerned about no longer seeing Holly. As Salon would later put it, When Holly Maddox, his delicately beautiful girlfriend of five years, disappeared in the fall of 1977, the transient college-based community around her and Einhorn paid little attention. He had been the important member of that couple, in any case, and his beautiful girlfriends were virtually interchangeable. But Holly's family didn't see it that way. After not receiving a card for her mom's birthday the following month, something Holly always sent, they contacted police in Philadelphia. Police were suspicious of Ira, but because he had such a good reputation in the community, it was difficult to get evidence on him. I assume people didn't want to talk. Members of Holly's family did ask Ira directly where she was. He said he didn't know and that she left to visit a local co-op but had never returned. He also said he'd gotten a phone call from her a few days after she disappeared saying that she was fine. Ira also told Holly's mom at one point that she'd simply left him and was out traveling on her own. At another point, both he and one of Holly's friends claimed that Holly was at a commune in India, though Holly's friend claimed to have gotten this information from a medium. Despite their initial suspicion of Ira, police also eventually started to believe that Holly had left willingly. With little to go on, the Maddox family hired two private detectives, one from their hometown of Tyler and another from Philadelphia. And these detectives uncovered some pretty incriminating information. One night in the fall of 1977, Paul Hare, who lived in the apartment below Ira's, said he had heard a scream. At first, he didn't think much of it, since there were a lot of loud parties in the neighborhood. But then a brown liquid began leaking from the ceiling. 
Paul called his landlord, who called a plumber, but there was one bedroom closet Ira refused to let the plumber in. Neighbors also reported a foul smell coming from the apartment. In late 1978, Ira went to a bookstore and asked for a book on mummification, but the bookstore owner didn't have the book he was looking for. In early 1979, the private detectives turned over all this information to police in Philadelphia. Then Police Chief Michael Chitwood said the information in these reports read like an Alfred Hitchcock movie. They were able to obtain a search warrant and, on March 28, 1979, they entered Ira Einhorn's apartment. Upon their arrival inside, the foul smell that had been reported by so many neighbors was still there. And it wasn't hard to find the source of it. Ira's bedroom closet. The closet had multiple padlocks on it. Michael Chitwood asked Ira if he had the key to it, but Ira said no. So the closet was pried open with a crowbar. Inside, the closet was stacked with boxes from floor to ceiling. One of the boxes had the word Maddox written on it and was filled with Holly's things, including her purse, which still had her driver's license and library card inside. There was also a steamer trunk in the closet. If you watched my recent video on the cheerleader in the trunk, or even if you didn't, you might know that a steamer trunk is a trunk you see in a lot of movies that characters use to pack their things in for long trips. Someone in the comment section of that video also said they were often used for storage or for wealthy children to take to boarding school or college. The steamer trunk in Ira's closet also had a padlock on it. So once again, Michael Chitwood asked him if he had the key, and once again, he said no. So once again, the steamer trunk was pried open with a crowbar. Inside the trunk, investigators found air freshener, styrofoam, and newspapers dated from August and September of 1977. There was also a hand in the chest. Michael Chitwood said it looked like it was trying to push the chest open. The hand belonged to an entire body in the trunk, mummified from the heat. Police knew right away they'd found the body of Holly Maddox in a trunk just a few feet away from Ira Einhorn's bed. When police turned around to confront Ira about the body, he simply replied, You found what you found. Ira Einhorn was immediately arrested and charged with murder. An autopsy would later confirm Holly's cause of death as craniocerebral injuries. Other sources would just simply list it as blunt force trauma. I have seen some people say that Holly was still alive when she was put in the trunk. I can't find anything substantial to confirm this, and the coroner's reports say she did die of blunt force trauma, not suffocation as these comments seem to imply. I assume the people commenting this got the information from Michael Chitwood's statement that the hand looked like it was trying to push the trunk open. But I don't think this is necessarily scientific evidence that she was still alive when put in the trunk. Ira Einhorn was set to go on trial in 1981. He faced the death penalty. As Michael Chitwood would later say, Everyone talked about how smart and wonderful Ira Einhorn was, but I always knew he was a murderer and a con man. And other people in Philadelphia agreed with him. Public opinion of Ira seemed to shift completely after his arrest. People were shocked that this charming, likable man had committed murder. According to Ira's friend George Keegan, We were walking down the street together. People who once would come up and hug Ira crossed the street and averted their eyes. He looked at me, sad, and said, I'm not going to be able to be Ira Einhorn now. And I realized he was a selfish, arrogant bastard. Ira unsurprisingly maintained his innocence, but his defense was a bit unusual. He claimed he had been framed by the CIA, the FBI, or maybe the KGB. He knew too much about things they were trying to keep hidden like conspiracies and weapons development, so Holly was murdered and it was pinned on him to discredit him. He also suggested at one point that Holly had had an affair with someone who worked at the CIA and this might provide motive. In fact, the trunk Holly's body was found in, according to him, normally held 
secret reports about KGB and CIA mind control experiments. But the evidence against him didn't look good. In addition to the information the private detectives had already found, he was also accused of attacking two of his ex-girlfriends after they tried to leave him, something that Holly had also recently done. His diaries corroborated both these stories and his general violent nature. He also reportedly asked two of his friends to help him get rid of the steamer trunk, though that obviously never happened. Earlier on in life, Ira had given himself the nickname the Unicorn. The name Einhorn apparently means one horn in German, so that's where he got it from. After his arrest, people began calling him the Unicorn Killer. Even though plenty of Philadelphia now hated Ira, he still had influential friends in all the right places. After his arrest, his bail was set at $40,000, unusually low for someone accused of first-degree murder. A wealthy acquaintance paid the $4,000 required, and Ira was released on bail in May 1979. Then in 1981, just a few weeks before his trial was set to start, he disappeared. Ira Einhorn was on the run, but he wasn't completely off everyone's radar. Over the years, he was cited in Canada, England, Ireland, and Sweden. In 1987, he married a Swedish woman named Annika Flodin. In the early 1990s, he told Annika that he was a fugitive and on the run, but that he was innocent of the crime he was being accused of. I'm not sure how many details he gave her, but she believed him and stuck by his side. At one point, the couple even lived just four blocks from a police station. Anytime someone got suspicious or a former friend or girlfriend of Iris tipped off the police, the couple would pack up and leave, always staying one step ahead of the law. In 1992, a U.S. law was passed that said suspects could be tried in absentia. This is basically just what it sounds like. A suspect can be put on trial even if they're not physically present. The following year, Ira Einhorn went on trial for the murder of Holly Maddox, even though he wasn't present in the building. He was convicted and sentenced to life in prison. Meanwhile, Ira and Annika had settled in the village of Champagne-Mouton in western France. I really hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. The couple bought a house that has been described by some sources as a farmhouse and others as a windmill or a converted windmill. I reposed as a mystery writer from England named Eugene Mallon, an identity he'd stolen from a bookstore owner in Ireland who had helped him out previously. At one point, he had also used the alias Ben Moore, which he got from a brand of paint. While in France, Ira even protested a proposed nuclear facility in his area, staying true to his environmentalist roots. But one man in particular wasn't giving up on finding Ira Einhorn. Richard Benedetto was an investigator with the Philadelphia District Attorney's Office, I'm not sure if he still is, and was determined to track Ira down. He interviewed numerous friends and ex-girlfriends of Ira who would give him Ira's location, but of course Ira always stayed one step ahead of the law. At one point, De Benedetto even talked to Eugene Mallon, the Irish bookstore owner who Ira had stolen the identity of, but Mallon refused to talk. The year Ira Einhorn escaped, De Benedetto became a first-time father. This gave him even more motivation to find Ira and get justice for Holly for her own parents. Unfortunately, they would never get to see Ira in custody. Fred Maddox took his own life in 1988, and his wife Elizabeth died of emphysema in 1990. But Richard De Benedetto never gave up, and it would eventually pay off. In May 1997, De Benedetto got yet another tip-off about Ira's whereabouts. Ira's wife, Annika, had applied for a French driver's license under the name Annika Flodine Mallon. De Benedetto, of course, recognized this last name Mallon as the identity of the bookstore owner who had helped out Ira in the past. He figured he must have stolen his identity. Upon this revelation, De Benedetto contacted French police. On the morning of June 13, 1997, they entered the couple's farmhouse slash windmill and found Ira asleep in bed. 
Despite giving his name as Eugene Mallon, Ira was immediately arrested and taken to a French prison. His identity was later confirmed through fingerprints. After 16 years on the run, a now 57-year-old Ira Einhorn had finally been caught. But getting Ira back to the U.S. was anything but easy. In 1997, a French court ruled that Ira couldn't be extradited. According to French law, people who had been convicted in absentia couldn't be sent back to their home country unless they were granted a new trial. Because the death penalty was illegal in France, they also refused to send Ira back unless the death penalty would be off the table for a new trial. Ira also had some supporters in France who thought his in absentia trial was a violation of his rights. Ira was eventually released on bail and continued to maintain his innocence, still saying he was the victim of framing and or a government conspiracy. In 1999, a civil suit was filed by the Maddox family to keep Ira from financially benefiting from his story or anything that had happened to him. They were eventually granted over $900 million. It was also around this time that the miniseries The Hunt for the Unicorn Killer was released. Writer Bruce Graham said the miniseries was inspired by Stephen Levy's book The Unicorn's Secret, published in 1990. Surprisingly, Ira didn't flee this time. In July 1999, a French court ruled that he would be extradited back to the U.S. to face a new trial. The night before he was set to leave, he slit his throat and requested to talk to reporters. This was apparently a suicide attempt, but he did survive. The next day, July 20th, 2001, he arrived back in the U.S. Ira's new trial began in September 2002. He still maintained his innocence, now saying he didn't know how Holly's body ended up in his apartment. His wife, Annika, who now went by Annika Einhorn, stuck by his side, but only metaphorically. She didn't travel to the U.S. for his trial, partially because she knew she would get a lot of negative attention and partially because she was afraid of being arrested for aiding an American fugitive. As far as I know, nobody has ever been arrested or charged for helping Ira hide or escape. On October 18, 2002, Ira Einhorn was found guilty of the murder of Holly Maddox and sentenced to life in prison without parole. A New York Times article published that day said he preached peace and love while battering his lovers. In April 2016, Ira was transferred to a minimum security prison. While this prison was for older and terminally ill inmates, no specific reason was given for the transfer. On April 3, 2020, Ira died in prison of cardiac problems at the age of 79. Before we go, I want to address one major controversy of this case. If you're familiar with it, you might be wondering why I haven't brought it up yet, but I did want to save it for the end. Was Ira Einhorn really the founder of Earth Day? Plenty of articles said he was. Others said he was a co-founder or that he helped organize it. Others insist he wasn't the founder and the founder was actually Gaylord Nelson. And others still say the Earth Day founders wanted to deny his involvement and disassociate themselves from him. So what is the truth? Did Ira Einhorn really found Earth Day or was that completely made up for whatever reason? As is often the case, the truth is somewhere in between. Ira was involved in the planning of the first Earth Day event back in 1970. He was on the organizing committee, but was kicked out of several meetings for his rude, obnoxious behavior. There's also a story about him grabbing the mic at that event when he wasn't supposed to. He later went on to claim he founded Earth Day, which is probably where the rumor got started. So to say he was actually the founder is an exaggeration, but he was involved in some capacity. So that's all I have for you today on the murder of Holly Maddox. Obviously, there's a lot more information out there about Ira Einhorn than there is about Holly. As sad as it is that she sometimes gets lost in the shuffle, I do understand why people find Ira so fascinating. He is one of a kind, to say the least. 
If you enjoyed this video, be sure to like and share it. And for more dark content, I hope you'll consider subscribing and hitting the bell. Thanks for watching and I will see you next time.